Tonight, Donald Trump prepares to be arraigned in court. I really do believe that uh, anyone who puts himself over the Constitution should never be president of the United States. The former president is expected to be in Washington tomorrow and appears for his arraignment after he was federally charged on multiple counts for his role in attempting to overturn the 2020 election. What his legal team is now saying and how the 2024 field is reacting. Plus, I, with all my heart, I have a feeling that this is not going to be here soon. I feel it within me because it's unnatural. It doesn't belong. It's the floating buoy at the center of a political fight. Our Maria Villarreal there with an up-close look at the Texas barrier causing an immigration battle. And... Do you think the Lakers can win another title? You bet. Any advice for your opponents? Better watch out. The Lakers are one of the biggest sports franchises in the world, but it wasn't built overnight. Quincy Isaiah is with us as he talks about the returning series that chronicles the creation of one of the greatest dynasties of all time. Good evening. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We're following those stories and much more, including the scary moment that brought the Capitol to a standstill as a potential shooter call shut down the Senate. Plus, AMC theaters may have had its best week ever, but tell that to the writers and actors out on the picket line. What's next for the fight that has shut down Hollywood and what it could mean for viewers at home? And they turned to GoFundMe to get to the World Cup. And now, after a draw against Brazil sends them to the next round, we're going to take a closer look at the Jamaican women's soccer team by the numbers. Our correspondents are fanned out across the country covering those stories and more for us tonight. But we are going to begin with former President Trump set to be arraigned tomorrow on new historic federal charges targeting for the first time actions by a sitting president. The other two indictments Trump is facing focus on his actions before and after taking office. For this indictment, Trump will need to appear at a D.C. federal courthouse tomorrow at 4 p.m. He will have his fingerprints taken and face a judge who has been notoriously tough on January 6th rioters. The four-count indictment centers around the fact that President Trump knew he had lost the election, was told repeatedly by Republicans and officials he appointed that he had lost, but still continued a pressure campaign to try to overturn the results that ended with what you're seeing here on the screen, the Capitol being stormed. So what else will happen at the hearing tomorrow, and how is the former president's team responding? Our chief justice correspondent, Pierre Thomas, leads us off on this busy Wednesday night. Tonight, federal court in Washington preparing for an unprecedented arraignment. A former president of the United States set to be fingerprinted and formally charged with trying to keep the White House even though he knew he lost. An alleged criminal scheme that erupted in violence on January 6th. And Donald Trump's supporters stormed the Capitol. It was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. But the indictment about more than Trump's public statements, it was about his actions too, including a relentless pressure campaign targeting Republican officials, including his own Vice President Mike Pence. Pence today reacting to the indictment, which mentions him and his role more than 100 times, and quotes Trump telling him, you're too honest. I've been very clear. I had hoped it wouldn't come to this. Pence testified before Smith's grand jury and turned over contemporaneous notes he took after his conversations with Trump. For my part, I want people to know that I had no right to overturn the election uh, and that uh, what the president maintained that day and frankly has said over and over again over the last two and a half years is completely false. The former president's attorney with this line of defense. This is an attack on free speech and political advocacy. And there's nothing that's more protected under the First Amendment. And tonight we're learning more about Judge Tanya Chutkin, who will preside over the case. An Obama appointee, Judge Chutkin, has handed down tough sentences to January 6th defendants. She's also rejected Trump's efforts to block the January 6th committee from obtaining his presidential records, declaring presidents are not kings. And Pierre joins me now here at the desk. Pierre, it's good to see you uh, in person. Walk us through what we can expect to see tomorrow when the former president appears for his arraignment. Well, he will enter a highly secure courthouse with stepped up security. He'll be fingerprinted and processed. Then he will make his way up to a hearing that will last about an hour. It'll be another high stakes, high drama day, Phil. Right. And this is a process he's seen before, twice now. He's already seen this process 
twice, but I think we cannot overstate repeatedly seeing a former president of the United States in court, this time facing allegations that he tried to steal an election. All right, Pierre Thomas, thanks so much. Pleasure. All right, let's now bring in ABC News legal contributor Khan Nawade, a former federal prosecutor for the Southern District of New York. Khan, it's always good to see you. Thanks for being here. This, in many ways, is the most substantive to, uh, update on what happened in the lead up to January 6th since the January 6th committee's work itself, which millions of Americans obviously watched in those hearings last year. So how does this indictment, does it build on their work or does it take it further? I think it absolutely builds on it and takes it further. If you'll recall, Phil, uh, one of the issues which the January 6th committee had was they did not have access to all the types of evidence that a DOJ prosecutor would have. Case in point is Mike Pence, the former vice president. One of the accusations that the January 6th committee set forth was basically that the former president, Mr. Trump, was coercing the vice president at the time to go his way with the vote count and the electoral vote. But they didn't have Mike Pence's side of the story. And what you see in the indictment is, well, special counsel Jack Smith got that side of the story. You mentioned Mike Pence. He's among one of the high-profile witnesses outlined in this indictment. As a federal prosecutor, how important is it to have this kind of eyewitness testimony for a case like this? It, it, it's absolutely critical. Um, and it, here, it looks like they have it. They have so many high-level executives and personnel who worked closely with the former president, and those are the types of people who would have direct evidence of the misconduct that's been alleged against the former president. We also have these six unindicted co-conspirators. Uh, break down the significance of none of them being charged yet. It would seem, and I'm not a lawyer, but it would seem like the government is maybe waiting for one of them to flip? Are they trying to flip up in this case? I think that has to be the plan. And frankly, I, I think the hope, if you're a prosecutor, you want people to cooperate before you charge the main defendant. And so here I see this as a weakness in the government's case because they don't have cooperating witness already on Team USA who are going to be ready to testify against the former president. So I think this is something they are hoping for. They are absolutely hoping for one of these co-conspirators to turn state's witness on the former president. I know you don't have a crystal ball, but how likely do you think that is? If it hasn't happened now, I, I think it's going to be kind of tough, but you have to wait and see. You know, defendants, until they're charged, they don't really know and get the... The, the significance of what's going on. So it could very well be, as the case progresses, that someone decides there's too much pressure to bear. And just lastly, Con, what's the former president's best defense, do you think, here? What case do you expect his side to make, and, and what hurdles do they face? I, I think, first of all, of all, they're going to try to move the venue. I think they're not going to be successful in that. I think they're going to try to move to dismiss the indictment based on some type of first amendment defense. I don't think they'll be successful on that. I think their best defense is one that, that attacks the intent element to say that there was no corrupt intent here. And the hurdle they're going to have to overcome with that is, frankly, to make that kind of defense, they're probably going to have to rely on the former president testifying. Hmm. All right. Khan Nawade, always good to have your experience. Thanks so much. And with security in the nation's capital already on alert ahead of former President Trump's court appearance tomorrow, there was a scare today at the Senate with a caller reporting an active shooter. Senate offices were immediately put on lockdown on Capitol Hill as officers searched floor to floor. But in the end, it appears to have been a false call. ABC's Aaron Katursky was on the scene in Washington. Tonight, on the eve of Donald Trump's arraignment in Washington, D.C., with security on high alert. Which way? evidence of how seriously authorities are taking any threat. Which way? Which way? Ow, ow, ow. A scare in the Senate triggering this massive police response. Hundreds of officers rushing to Capitol Hill. We could hear banging and screaming. We could hear shouting uh, in the halls. <laughs> authorities say it started with a concerning call, an active shooter inside a Senate office building around 2.30 in the afternoon. The caller did not report hearing gunshots, but gave police a description of someone wearing body armor. See where the bench is. That's where you need to be. Go back. The Senate side of the Capitol put on lockdown. We see about 20 Capitol Hill police running down the hall with uh, vests on, guns drawn. 
Officers searching the three Senate office buildings floor by floor before giving the all clear. We found no confirmation that there was an active shooter um, and that this may have been a, a, a bogus call. But tonight, authorities say they are prepared for anything with history set to play out in this city tomorrow. And Aaron joins me now. Aaron's security preps are already underway in Washington for tomorrow's arraignment. So what's the scene like there? Here at the Capitol, Phil, we're told physical barriers are going to be going up tonight in advance of former President Trump's appearance tomorrow. And police say they have been preparing for this for weeks in the event that Trump was, in fact, indicted. Police around the courthouse say security is going to be very tight, and they say they are ready for anything. Phil? I bet. All right. Aaron Katursky from Capitol Hill. Aaron, thank you. Now to the sentencing verdict in the Shabbat massacre at a Pittsburgh synagogue nearly five years ago now. The jury voted unanimously that Robert Bowers deserves the death penalty for what is the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. Tonight, the families and survivors are weighing in. Ariel Resha reports. Tonight, the gunman who stormed that Pittsburgh synagogue, killing 11 in the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in U.S. history, sentenced to death by a federal jury. He murdered them because they were Jewish. After 10 hours of deliberations, the same 12 jurors who weeks earlier found Robert Bowers guilty on all 63 criminal counts, voting unanimously that he should be put to death. Hate has no place in our community. A judge will now decide whether to uphold that jury recommendation. Prosecutors have said Bowers was hunting for Jews when he entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in October 2018, gunning down congregants during Sabbath prayers, the victims ages 54 to 97. Just before his deadly rampage, prosecutors say Bowers posted anti-Semitic and xenophobic rants on social media. At trial, Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, seen here in this police body camera video fleeing the massacre, flanked by the SWAT team, testifying about his desperate call to 911. Today we've received an immense embrace from the halls of justice around all of us. Tonight, families of the victims and survivors reacting to the jury's decision. The daughter of Daniel Stein saying justice has been served. I feel like a weight has been lifted and I can breathe a sigh of relief. May my father's light shine eternally and his memory along with the 10 other victims forever be a blessing. Ariel joins me now. Ariel, what comes next in this case? Well, Phil, as soon as tomorrow morning, the court could hear victim impact statements from those whose lives were forever changed that day. And then the judge will decide whether to uphold the jury's recommendation of the death penalty. Phil. Yeah, no doubt that will be powerful. Ariel Reshef, thanks so much. New York City police have identified a suspect in the deadly stabbing 28-year-old dancer O'Shea Sibley. Sibley was dancing at a gas station with his friends as they filled up their car when a bystander who was at the scene said they were confronted by a group who yelled homophobic slurs before Sibley was stabbed. A new surveillance video viewed by police shows a heated exchange between the two groups. This week, New York City Mayor Eric Adams said, quote, we will find the person responsible. The killing has put a renewed spotlight on the violence against the LGBTQ plus community. Tonight, we are also tracking a wild case in Oregon involving possible serial kidnapper. A woman says she escaped her captor in Oregon who kidnapped her and held her in a cinder block jail cell in his garage. That case has the FBI opening up a nationwide investigation. The question is, could there be more victims out there? Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman reports. Tonight, the FBI says a young woman fought tooth and nail to free herself from this cinder block cell to escape from a man they allege is a serial rapist. The woman fought for her life, beating the doors and the walls of this cell with bloodied hands. The FBI naming 29-year-old Nagasi Zuberi as the suspect, saying he had many other aliases, but whose career as an alleged predator living in plain sight began to unravel in Seattle on July 15th when he is accused of posing as a police officer. He kidnapped a prostitute. According to the complaint, Zuberi drove her 450 miles to his home in Klamath Falls, Oregon. They say he then locked her in this makeshift cell. Cinder blocks, a naked light bulb, that hardback chair, and some water. He had actually locked her in there for a couple hours at least until she realized that she needed to get out of that residence because her life was in danger. So they said she decided to fight. 
When she was trying to escape the cell itself, she had repeatedly punched it with her own hands, and she had several lacerations along her knuckles. Through her perseverance, she broke free and waved down a passing motorist, asking for their help to call 911. The next day, officials capturing Zuberi in this Walmart parking lot in Reno, Nevada. The complaint saying there was a standoff, Zuberi in the car with his children. It's actually quite common for serial offenders to become more violent as they move along. The fantasy and obsession become much greater. To fulfill it, they have to become more violent. Authorities already recovering these disturbing handwritten notes. In one, he jotted, dig a hole straight down 100 feet. Another, entitled Operation Takeover, describes what appear to be best practices for a kidnapping, including make sure they don't have a bunch of people in their life. You don't want any type of investigation. All right, some really terrifying details in this case. Matt Gutman joins me now. Matt, where does this investigation go from here? The short answer, Phil, is that it spreads. It gets wider. The long answer is that investigators believe that this suspect is linked to at least four other violent sexual assaults in four states. They know that he's lived in 10 states since 2016, and they suspect that there could be many additional victims out there. That's why the FBI is asking anyone with information to contact them. Phil. Wow, this is going to be a broad investigation. Matt, thanks so much. A Georgia mother of three is under arrest in the Bahamas, accused of plotting to kill her estranged husband. The couple, in the middle of a bitter divorce and custody battle, despite her social media posts that paint a, a very rosy picture. Here's Eva Pilgrim. Tonight, a Georgia mother of three behind bars, accused of plotting to kill her estranged husband while he was on a trip to the Bahamas. Last but not least, I want to thank me. For years, Lindsay Shiver posted glimpses of the family's picture-perfect life on social media, many during vacations in the Bahamas. But prosecutors now say the 36-year-old mother hatched a plan with her lover and a hitman to murder her husband of 13 years, Robert Shiver. Bahamian police say they stumble upon the alleged plot while investigating her new boyfriend, Terrence Bethel, for an unrelated burglary, finding incriminating messages on his phone. The Shivers were college sweethearts who met at Auburn University, where Robert played football for the Tigers. But court documents show the couple was in the midst of a divorce. Earlier this year, Robert filing citing adulterous conduct, Lindsay replying accusing him of physical and mental cruelty and acts of domestic violence, saying she feels unsafe in the marital home. Our thanks to Eva Pilgrim. Now to the migrant crisis, which is stretching from the border to major cities now, including right here in New York. Uh, New York Mayor Eric Adams is making a, a new plea for federal help to handle the influx of migrants now on the city's streets. Stephanie Ramos spoke with some of them today and has the latest. Tonight, New York City officials sounding the alarm after these concerning images. Hundreds of migrants on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan. We need help. We need, we need help, and it's, it's not going to get any better. Uh, from, from this moment on, on it's downhill. Dozens sleeping on cardboard outside the Roosevelt Hotel, waiting for a spot inside the intake center. Police officers offering food. It's not a healthy position for folks to be in, especially after having such long journeys. New York nearing a breaking point while crossings are down at the southern border. Busloads of migrants are still arriving in the city every week. More than 95,000 asylum seekers have arrived since last spring. Nearly two thirds of them are now in the city's care. City shelters at capacity. Hey. Ranier Adrián came from Venezuela. He's been waiting for a room at the Roosevelt for two days. No me quejo y esperaré el tiempo que sea necesario que yo... So many here have come from so far away, but like Raniel, they say they prefer this wait to the dangers back home. Stephanie joins me now. Stephanie, what are New York City officials saying about how long this particular migrant influx could last? Well, they say there's really no telling. City officials just today said that 2,300 asylum seekers arrived in New York City last week alone. They say there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, and they are urgently asking for the federal government's help. Phil. All right. Stephanie Ramos from New York City. Stephanie, thank you. There is still much more to get to here on Prime tonight. Coming up, he is accused of faking his own death 
and assuming a different identity in another country to avoid charges. The decision on whether he can be extradited back to the U.S. But next in our prime focus, a major river is at the center of a legal battle between Texas and the federal government. And that battle has wide ranging implications for local businesses and for those who use it as a way to seek the American dream. I had hundreds of National Guardsmen here putting the T-posts in with all the sea wire and they wouldn't stop. And I asked them, please stop. We don't want this. Uh, we've asked you not to put it up. They weren't listening. Whenever news breaks. The crush of families here in Poland. Here in Kentucky, no match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California, on the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina, on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California, covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting from the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today, YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about, the new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? <laughs> Let's go. How are you? <laughs> How cute. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. The Rio Grande along our nation's southern border has become the focal point for a battle over buoys between Texas and the federal government. But it also serves as a lifeline for local businesses and for others. It's the final dangerous stretch to safety in the American dream. In tonight's prime focus, our Maria Villarreal takes us to Eagle Pass, Texas and introduces us to local business owners tired of the river and their communities being used as political pawns. We're individuals going on a waterway that's very challenging. The sun is rising in Eagle Pass, Texas, and for the first time in months, Jesse Fuentes is getting back to work. So, All right, push seven, off with eight, the paddle. Yeah. Fuentes retired eight years ago in his hometown along the border and started Epi's Canoes and Kayaking. It's always been my passion to be on the river. And I've been on most of the rivers of Texas. And the best one that I found is in my backyard, my hometown where I grew up. But over the last year, Eagle Pass has become the epicenter of Governor Greg Abbott's initiative, Operation Lone Star. And as a part of the operation, the state recently closed Shelby Park, a public area frequented by locals and to some extent, home base for Fuentes' business. For you, is this just about a business? It's about the river. It's always been about the river and everything that's connected to it. My business, my community, my culture. Fuentes got special permission from local city leaders to take a small group on the river for just four hours. We are just about to put our kayaks in, so we have safety gear on. This is the one that I'm taking. Photographer right here, Juan, that's his as well. So it's gonna be about a two hour journey down to the buoys. Across the river in Piedras Negras, Mexico, a stark contrast to the images of the Texas riverbank. 
About a mile down where we put in, we see people wading through the water with several young children, sometimes in water so deep it's above their chest. So there is definitely several groups here in this area. The one towards the back has a little girl, she's seven years old. They're from Venezuela. ¿Y por qué, por qué cruzaron aquí en esta área? ¿Es más fácil? Several people in the group tell us they tried to ask the guardsmen and troopers above for help, but were told they had to walk further to find immigration agents. ¿Cómo estás? Cansado. Sí. Cansado y preocupado. Porque desde allá nos venían siguiendo, desde el cartel. ¿Ah, sí? Sí. ¿No tienen otra opción ahorita? No, no tenemos más que pasar. Porque si nos regresamos... ¿Qué van a pasar? As the migrants continue to walk, we move further down river, coming face to face with the latest immigration controversy floating right in the middle of the Rio Grande. From the images and videos that we have seen so far, it might look like this barrier goes all along the Rio Grande River, but really, as you're able to get up close to them and see what this really is, it's about a quarter mile down. And people here that traveled with us have said, if groups want to get around this barrier, they'll find a way. The Department of Justice is suing the state of Texas and Governor Abbott over these red buoys. They claim the hard plastic balls tethered to the bottom of the river with heavy cable wire were installed without consulting the Army Corps of Engineers and it violates several international treaties. Fuentes is also suing Texas and the governor over this barrier and the inability to conduct business on the river. Abbott has said he is not removing this. So where do we stand? I, with all my heart, I have a feeling that this is not going to be here soon. <laughs> I feel it within me because it's unnatural. It doesn't belong. When we finish floating, we end up near a pecan farm owned by Hugo and Magali Urbina. As Republicans who voted for Governor Abbott, the pair initially supported his push to protect the border. But more recently, that's changed. Something happened and we just saw them take over completely from the Shelby Park. We saw large equipment come in and they just started bulldozing everything. I had hundreds of National Guardsmen in here putting the T-posts in with all the sea wire and they wouldn't stop. And I would ask them, please stop. We don't want this. Uh, we've asked you not to put it up. They weren't listening. To fight windmills along the southern border. The Urbina family is now joining a chorus of community members pushing the city to rethink its agreement with Operation Lone Star. DPS didn't respond to our request for comment, but a regional director did speak in front of the Eagle Pass City Council about the need to keep all of this in place. Maverick County Attorney Jaime Iracheta agreed. We are a small community. This is not something that is sustainable. This is not something that we can handle. And we need some form of law enforcement presence. Ultimately, I'm here to protect the citizens that are getting overrun every single day. Every single day from our small property owners to our large property owners. They can't live anymore. We have literally 200 plus people a night going through somebody's front yard. Although apprehension numbers along the border have continued to fall in recent months, Ida Chata worries if Operation Lone Star pulls out, another influx of migrants will quickly follow. For Jesse Fuentes, the worry goes well beyond Operation Lone Star. You see all the buildup here, and I just don't know how determined our governor is to keep disrespecting the river and, and the people that live by it. Just disrespecting human beings. Maria Varial, our thanks to Maria from the Rio Grande. Now to an ABC News Live Prime exclusive about a migrant family who claims they were separated at the border by CBP. This after Hearst Newspapers is out with its own report claiming Texas troopers are separating families at the border, specifically fathers from their partners and children. In a statement to ABC News, Texas DPS acknowledged there have been instances in which they arrested a male migrant on state charges who were with their family when the alleged crime occurred and goes on to say that children and their mothers were never separated, instead turned over to Customs and Border Patrol. But take a listen to this father sharing his account of the days being separated from his daughter and partner. How okay. difficult was it to be separated from your family? 
tenaz como nunca antes hubiera imaginado. Fue un momento que no lograba controlar, que me había esforzado en cantidad para formar un hogar y que eso se iba a destruir y se iba a ver vulnerado por, por una decisión. You will get to hear more about their harrowing time apart in the coming days as ABC News Live Prime continues to cover our nation's immigration and humanitarian crisis. There is still much more to get to here tonight. New developments in the death of actor Treat Williams, who is, who is now facing charges in his death. A deeper look at the Hollywood strikes, what George Clooney, Meryl Streep, Leonardo DiCaprio, and Dwayne The Rock Johnson all have in common and how they're helping SAG-AFTRA's cause. But next, they had to raise funds just to make the trip. Now the Jamaican women's soccer team is celebrating moving on to the next round. We take a look at their successes on the field by the numbers. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. Imagine if you had an institution where it was almost impossible to be held accountable. What happened with the police made me scared of them. No mother should have to bury their child. Amir Locke was killed in a botched, no-knock warrant situation. How these cops operate in this country has been America's dirty secret. Because of the color of his skin, he didn't have a chance. This is under the police. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is The King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey, I'm David Muir. Wherever the story, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. 
Welcome back. Jamaica's women's World Cup team has pulled off a stunner, so we're going to take a look at them by the numbers. The underdog Jamaican team has reached the round of 16 for the first time after they managed a draw against Brazil's women's national team. Known as the Reggae Girls, Jamaica was ranked 43rd in the world going into World Cup play, but so far they've gone unbeaten in three matches with a win over Panama and draws against Brazil and France, one of the favorites, by the way, to win the tournament. The Cinderella squad has has had to fight just for its place in the tournament, even relying on a GoFundMe page that has raised more than $55,000 and counting since it was launched by one of the players' mothers to help fund their expenses. The Reggae Girls team was most recently disbanded in 2016 by the Jamaican Football Federation, which has been criticized for failing to support the women's team. But the squad was resurrected in time to qualify for the 2019 World Cup, becoming the first Caribbean nation to make the women's tournament after getting a pretty big boost from the daughter of reggae legend Bob Marley, who is now serving as an ambassador for the team, pushing to get them the funding to compete. As for Brazil, it marks the first time in 28 years they failed to advance out of the group stage of the tournament. And it also spells the end of the World Cup amazing career for 37-year-old Brazilian striker Marta, who is the all-time leading scorer in men's or women's World Cups with 17 goals over six tournaments. We say best of luck to the reggae girls in the next round. And there is much more ahead here on Prime. Actress Leah Remini files a major lawsuit, who she's accusing of harassment and defamation. And the rise of a revered sports dynasty, how the latest season of Winning Time will cover some of the most pivotal moments in Lakers history. What does it take to be America's number one news? It takes asking the straightforward, tough questions. Do you believe that Donald Trump should ever be president again? How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? The newsmaking interviews. You said that there were six friends. One of them was sick. Yeah. Do you have future political aspirations? Going to the front line. The search for survivors. How does this war end? And getting to the heart of the story. Thank you for being here. We'll be here for the long run. ABC News, number one in the morning. The number one newscast. Number one in daytime talk. Friday nights, Sunday mornings versus the competition. And the number one streaming news. Thank you for making ABC News America's trusted, straightforward first choice. First thing in the morning. There's a lot going on. Everybody in that home is okay. To catch you up with what happened overnight. We are here at fashion's biggest night out. What's happening today? YouTube has unveiled a new set of policies. What people are talking about. The new ad campaign. Fast, straightforward. With some fun in between. A real life Barbie dream house. A name change for the Wienermobile. First thing in the morning. America This Morning. America's number one early morning news. On ABC News Live. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Get ready, America, every Friday. The hottest trends, styles, and must-have. What's the right stuff to buy right now? I really love that. It's time to buy the right stuff. Yes! And save big time, too. The right stuff. Fridays on GMA. You're going to love it. This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. 
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Can I hug you? Yeah. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Welcome back. New details in the case of a man accused of faking his death to avoid a rape charge. The celebrity filing a lawsuit against the Church of Scientology and Bed Bath & Beyond makes a comeback. Those stories and more in tonight's Rundown. A judge in Scotland today ruling a man there accused of faking his own death can be extradited back to the United States. Officials say he has gone by several names right now being identified in Scotland as Nicholas Rossi. But officials believe he's actually an American, Nicholas Aliverdian, charged with rape in Utah. Officials say he faked his own death with an obituary published in 2020. Vermont prosecutors charging a man in that crash that killed actor Treat Williams. They cited Ryan Koss with grossly negligent operation with death resulting in the June 12th crash. A Vermont State Police investigation found Koss drove his SUV into the path of Williams' motorcycle. Police say the actor was not able to avoid the crash and died from his injuries. Koss scheduled to be arraigned in September. Actress Leah Remini says she will sue the Church of Scientology and its leader, David Miscavige. The former King of Queens TV actress filed the lawsuit in California Superior Court claiming mob-style operations and attacks against her, as well as other victims and survivors of the church. The church has not officially responded to the lawsuit. In a post to her substack, Remini said the lawsuit comes after 17 years of harassment, intimidation, surveillance, and defamation by the church against her, saying she hopes the lawsuit protects her and others' rights to speak the truth about Scientology without fearing retribution. WWE Executive Chairman Vince McMahon has been given a federal grand jury subpoena, a WWE filing with the SEC saying the federal law enforcement agents executed a search warrant and served McMahon with a subpoena on July 17th. WWE had investigated allegations of misconduct made against its chairman last year, with the Wall Street Journal reporting an alleged $3 million payment to a female worker after a consensual affair. The fallout continues over the hazing scandal that rocked Northwestern University's football team. In a press conference today, former player Ramon Diaz detailed the hazing and abuse he says he faced from the team from 2005 to 2008. Northwestern has faced multiple former player lawsuits claiming former coach Pat Fitzgerald and his staff should have known about the program's toxic culture but did nothing to address it. University telling ABC News yesterday it was taking steps including monitoring the locker room and implementing new anti-hazing training and a new reporting tool. Also today, the university announced it has hired former U.S. Attorney General Loretta Lynch to review those allegations. Bed Bath & Beyond is back. One month after Overstock.com purchased the brand from bankruptcy, the name has returned. The Bed Bath & Beyond stores will remain closed, but now if you type in Overstock.com, it will redirect you to BedBathAndBeyond.com. And once you get there, you're going to find some additional things like furniture and some of the big items that we're accustomed to at Overstock. Streaming television and movies has literally changed the way we consume content and is fueling the current Hollywood strikes. Dwayne The Rock Johnson, George Clooney, Meryl Streep, Leonardo DiCaprio, just a few of the celebrities who have donated seven figures to provide aid to fellow sag after members as they forego paychecks during the time of the strike. Actors started striking last month, writers in May, all saying while their shows get millions of views on streaming, their residual checks can be just a few dollars. Claire Atkinson, a contributor at the website, The Ankler, and host of The Media Mix, joins us now to talk about what's happening. Um, Claire, thanks so much for taking the time. We understand that studios have reached out to writers, but not 
to negotiate necessarily, to talk about the negotiations? What's that about? Right. It feels like Friday there could be some momentum here. We've got two things going on. We've got that request to meet, and we also have these huge stars like Dwayne Johnson, Oprah Winfrey, Meryl Streep saying, this sucks, guys. We want some movement. We're going to donate money. Um, I love Meryl Streep's comment. She said these uh, corporate executives are taking the humanity out of the profession and also the human. And that speaks to this idea that AI, AI. is a big problem for actors and writers. Yeah, and it, that's going to be part of the negotiations, obviously. Do you think that is a deal breaker? I think that there's so many deal breakers. They mm. want higher wages. They want an 11% increase. Uh, uh, around five in the, in the couple of years after that. Um, so there's a lot on the table. There's so many discussions. What we've got in the backdrop to all of this is a big media earnings season where Wall Street's going to be asking the likes of Warner and Paramount and Disney, where are the profits from these streaming services? You've spent billions of dollars. Now where's the profits? And on the other side of that, they have the actors and the writers saying, you got to give us more of this pie. We need to see uh, revenues come to us. We want residuals that represent what we're contributing to the table here. So during a strike, these are some big demands. Do you think anything less than what they're asking for uh, will be able to you know, end, end the strikes for either union? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, they would say, we've been on strike for three months. In the case of the writers, the actors a little bit less. I think July 13th was the date they went on strike. And they're holding firm, at least the comments that I've been reading on X or Twitter, uh, it, it feels like that they're digging their heels in and they want what they want, and there's no uh, compromise here. There have been reports, at least with the WGA, some studios are waiting it out, seeing if the writers you know, at the end of the day, we'll eventually have no money to pay bills. Um, you know, that's obviously a tactic. You think it can work? Uh, I think it's possible, but I think, as I said, with these big celebrities bearing down on these CEOs who know these people personally, to have that pressure, they also have the pressure of the California state retirement system, which has been, um, uh, the actors and the writers have been reaching out saying this could be uh, a threat to, to this uh, asset, you should do something. So they're using every lever they can to put pressure on those studios and, you know, we'll hear what those studio bosses will have to say this week and next week. And just for our viewers to understand, you talked about AI. What are they arguing here? The so if you're, if you're a background actor, you come on the set, you do your thing, and then they need to change something or they need different lines and you come back. Uh, what the fear is, is that that little digital uh, replication of who you are can be manipulated to insert those words into your mouth and that they don't need to pay you again. So there's no coming so, back for another day rate exactly, or whatever Exactly, they is. just have to pay you for a half a day or a full day, whereas perhaps before it was, you know, however many days or weeks they needed you. Talk about the changing landscape. It's yes. literally changing in front of us. Yeah. Um, so if this is still going on through the fall, and, and that's, you know, a big business concern, um, what could spring lineups look like in the summer block? blockbusters look like? Yeah, I think uh, we've got momentum at the movies with Barbie and Oppenheimer, and then we've got this fear that perhaps there aren't any movies. We get people back to the cinemas, and then suddenly there's no movies to watch. There's the fear that we might not be able to see the Emmys, and the schedules are being changed up, like what would happen to the Oscars if there's no writers to write the lines? Uh, what happens to red carpet if there's nobody to promote the movies? So I think that the th the thought is that everybody can go a couple of months and still be okay. There's plenty of news and sports that the broadcast networks and the cable networks and the streamers can pipe in there instead. But if it goes longer, if it goes to January, then there's real pain at the studios. Oh, pain on both sides, oh, yeah, actually. I was going to say pain on both sides pain because both it, the, yeah. these folks who are striking, um, you know, they're foregoing their paychecks. And then at the end of the day, if when the deal is made, they've still lost all that money. Absolutely. And the studios are losing money, they too. Want, so. They want to see a new business model that compensates them, gives them residuals, gives them a piece of that revenue that may come with streaming. Yeah, strikes are never really good for anybody. Nope. Um, all right, well, Claire Atkinson, thanks so much for taking the time, bringing your expertise to the show. I appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. And thanks to the Barbenheimer box office boom, theater chain AMC is reporting its best week ever for ticket sales. Our Becky Worley has a look at what's really driving those numbers. 
on, Barbie, let's go to the movies. This is the best day ever. It is the best day ever. AMC is saying it's the best week ever, thanks in part to Barbenheimer's box office takeover. Barbie and Oppenheimer smashing records. Let's go recruit some scientists. And sending ticket sales soaring to new heights. The movie theater giant raking in more revenue from July 21st to 27th than at any other time in the company's 103-year history. AMC chairman and CEO Adam Aaron saying the two blockbusters have given them the opportunity to rewrite what is possible at the box office. What's so interesting about Barbie and Oppenheimer is really the pop culture craze that has followed the two two of them. It is the idea that these movies couldn't be more opposite, but have come together um, in a way that, that rarely happens at the box office. Barbie becoming more than just a movie to run to. Hi, Barbie. Hi, Barbie. Fans flooding their social media accounts, making it the dress-up event of the summer. In the first two weeks of its release, Variety reporting Barbie has grossed $774 million. Another contributor, the movie chain diversifying its business. The May earnings report stating food and beverage revenue increased 30% since 2022, with offerings like full meals and alcohol delivered to your seat in about 50 theaters. Introducing AMC Theaters Perfectly Popcorn. And selling their famed popcorn in grocery stores to bring home the flavor of the movies. But before we celebrate that theaters are saved, Experts say this historic moment with the labor strikes in Hollywood could mean an uncertain future at the box office. Uh, thanks to Becky Worley for that. Uh, time now for our series Streamline, where we take you behind the scenes of some of the biggest films and TV series. HBO is back with season two of its hit series Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty. The series, based on the book Showtime, Magic, Kareem, Riley, and the Los Angeles Lakers Dynasty of the 1980s by Jeff Perlman, chronicles the professional and personal lives of the 1980s Los Angeles Lakers, one of sports most revered and dominant dynasties ever. Trevor Alt sat down with actor Quincy Isaiah to discuss the reprisal of his starring role as Irvin Magic Johnson in season two. We just should add that this interview was recorded before the current sag after strike. Basketball is the sport of the decade. You got the kids on the team now. The bus empire is taking off. We brought home the gold. But one ring ain't gonna keep us in that room. We gotta keep winning. Look, Irma, you know why nobody repeats? Because the guys that you beat along the way, they spent all that time figuring out new ways to break you down. Quincy Isaiah, a pleasure to have you here. Yeah, appreciate it. Thanks so much for making time. The show is fantastic. I'm a huge fan, and mm -hmm. I had high hopes for it as a basketball fan also, so you, you really deliver. Mm -hmm. I mean, my main question for you, is your face tired from the smiling in every scene as Whoa. Magic Johnson? I actually don't do too much smiling this season. Okay. So, uh, that's a difference from season one. Yeah, season one, it was a lot of smiling. Uh, but, like, even then, it was, it was genuine, and I think just, like, um, being able to be happy and uh, adapting uh, in season one to the like new world that Magic was in, coming from Michigan to LA, and like being a professional basketball player now, it's so different from season two where he's uh, he's gotten acclimated to that life, right? Mm -hmm. And he's at the highest peak. And in episode one, we find out that he gets hurt and that he has a baby on the way. And it's these other life things that um, causes him not to smile. Here we go. All right, let's go. Oh, for Cap. Go, go, hustle. I got Magic. Oh. Irvin, slow down. Wait for your captain. Here. EJ, EJ. Right here. Come on. Slow down. It's so interesting when you're playing a real person. Mm -hmm. Not only like you need to move like them and talk like them, but playing a specific sport mm -hmm. like Magic Johnson, who has such distinctive, the way he throws passes, it's yeah. always like the one knee up, things like that, and you got it down, but what's the process of training your body in that way? Yeah, because I was a football player, I was so much more like, um rigid in my movement mm -hmm. we had to like really break down my body movement. in order to do that it was a lot of um sitting in the mirror and just with the ball and seeing how my hands go and like moving and um a lot of reps of 
dribbling and passing. And Edon Ravine was our basketball coach, and he made sure of uh, being very specific yeah. on just how um, right we needed to get this, uh, yeah. the, the, the silhouette of Magic. Exactly. Right? That, I mean, that was what I was going to say, is if you just saw a silhouette of Magic mm -hmm. Johnson, Basketball fans would be like, oh, that's Magic Johnson right mm. there, because of the way that, it, the fluidity which you talk about Good. there. And the basketball scenes are the most breathtaking part of the show. How long do those scenes take to practice and then to nail? Well, it depends, because it's so many, it depends on how many um, beats, like mm -hmm. story beats are in the, um, the basketball scene, because we don't right. look at it as like a basketball scene, it's story, you know? Yeah. We look at it as just another piece of the story. So like, the beats in the story are mapped out in a way that like, we'll have a basketball day and we got these specific beats that we gotta hit on this day. A huge part is the relationship between Magic Johnson and Larry Bird. Mm. And that's obviously a part of season one, but it seems like season two that really ramps up. What's the key to developing that chemistry? Because that rivalry is kind of legendary. They're the dynasty. We're the flash in the pan. And that's all we're ever going to beat until we beat the Celtics. Yeah, even hearing the name Larry Bird just makes me itch a little bit. I ain't going to lie. <laughs> um, no, uh, Sean Patrick Small is just, he's killing it in season two. And, um, just our relationship, I think, makes it that much easier for me to play into our character's relationship. I, I really can't wait to watch all of his scenes and just see how how great he's brought that character to life mm -hmm. and the intensity and the way that he's just carried himself. You were really open about, I mean, after Winning Time came out, you talked about how before the show was released, mm -hmm. you went to therapy. Because mm -hmm. like this was gonna be a pretty major change for your life, your first big role. Yeah. How you feeling now going into season two overall? Is there something, have you have you changed your goals or your focus in any way? I would say I'm very much more comfortable in the celebrity of it all, right? I think I was more so worried about invasion of privacy and mm -hmm. just like feeling like claustrophobic to like um, the new pressures of being in the public face. But honestly, it's been overwhelmingly positive mm -hmm. and like people just, are really excited about the show. How about the craft of acting, getting to pick it up for a second season? I mean, it's one thing to like hit the lottery, you, get, you land the dream role. Yeah. Now you get to keep everyone, like the praise is universal, you get to keep going. I yeah. mean, I can't even imagine. Yeah, and just the work that we get to do in season two, just the, the depths of magic that we get to see this season <laughs> is very um, rewarding as an actor. And I'm just blessed that uh, Max and Rodney wrote scripts that allowed me to take it to that place mm -hmm. and that they trusted me with the stories that they gave me. And just acting again, acting alongside of John, uh, uh, Rob Morgan, uh, um, Adrian, Jason, like all these people that, Tamara, uh, just people that I really look up to and admire and that's really good at their jobs. And um, pushing me, they push me to be better. And I just hope that that's, um, that it shows and that I can continue to keep going that route, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, we're looking forward to seeing it. Listen, man, they don't cast somebody to play Magic Johnson unless you got, like, megawatt charisma, so I, thank you. you should be very proud. It's a pleasure to meet you. Appreciate it. Thank you for making time for us. Yeah, thank you. Good luck. Yeah, we out here. Our thanks to Trevor Ald and Quincy Isaiah for that. Season two of the HBO original series Winning Time, The Rise of the Lakers Dynasty, premieres August 6th on HBO Max. And that's our show for this hour. I'm Phil Lipoff. Stay with ABC News Live for more context and analysis of the day's top stories. Thanks for streaming with us. And coming up in the next hour, desperate rescue efforts in China after a heavy rain and flooding. What's causing these dangerous conditions? And access to maternal care can sometimes be the difference between life and death for those expecting. What a study found about the major issues with finding care here in the U.S. 
This is ABC News Live Prime. Thanks so much for streaming with us. Live reporting, breaking news, exclusives, award-winning, powerful, eye-opening. ABC News Live Prime with Lindsay Davis. Streaming weeknights. From America's number one news comes the all-new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're going to love this. Experience the all-new ABC News app. Download it now. This is where the newsmakers come first in the morning to be heard. America's number one morning show. How would your mom feel about your relationship with your brother now? I can't imagine what it feels like to go from $20 billion to $100,000. Yeah. Are you worried about going to jail? You write that you had low-grade depression. Mm -hmm. How'd you get out of that? Wherever the story, ABC's Good Morning America is right there. This is ABC News Live. The crush of families the here in Poland. At refugee centers. In Putin's Russia. On the ground in Ukraine. Close to the front line. From the capital. Destructive. Cat 4 storm. Here along I-5. Boston is in the bullseye. Let's go. ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. Anytime, anywhere. Streaming 24-7. Straight to you for free. Thank you for making ABC News Live. America's number one streaming news. It was the ideal marriage. Little did I know I was married to a man who had done something so horrible that it would devastate our lives forever. Teacher of the Year is now charged with sex crimes. Only on Hulu. He was living a double life. The shocking story behind a number one true crime podcast. Prostitutes, escorts. He even cheated on me the week of our wedding. Betrayal, the perfect husband. He had a lot of fantasies. Now streaming only on Hulu. All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? <laughs> yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You got to think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force, and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. Reporting from Monterey Park, California, I'm Robin Roberts. Wherever, wherever the story is, we're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Good evening. This is ABC News Live Prime. I'm Phil Lipoff in tonight for Lindsay Davis. Thanks so much for streaming with us. We've got a lot of news to get to tonight, including the scare that shut down the Capitol after a 911 call brought the nation's center of power to a standstill. Plus, the jury that convicted Robert Bowers for killing 11 people inside a Pittsburgh synagogue has now decided whether he should be put to death. We'll have the decision for you. And what brought massive rain and flooding that led to intense rescue efforts in Beijing and surrounding cities? We go around the world for you as well. But we are going to begin with former President Trump set to be arraigned tomorrow on new historic federal charges, targeting for the first time actions by a sitting president. The other two indictments Trump is facing focus on his actions before and after taking office. For this indictment, Trump will need to appear at a D.C. federal courthouse tomorrow at 4 p.m. The four-count indictment centers around the fact that President Trump knew he had lost the election, was told repeatedly by Republicans and other officials he appointed that he had lost, but still continued a pressure campaign to try to overturn the results. And how is the former president and his team responding tonight? Chief Justice Correspondent Pierre Thomas leads us off on this busy Wednesday night. Tonight, federal court in Washington preparing for an unprecedented arraignment. A former president of the United States set to be fingerprinted and formally charged with trying to keep the White House even though he knew he lost. The alleged criminal scheme that erupted in violence on January 6th. And Donald Trump's supporters stormed the Capitol. It was fueled by lies. Lies by the defendant targeted at obstructing a bedrock function of the U.S. government 
the nation's process of collecting, counting, and certifying the results of the presidential election. But the indictment about more than Trump's public statements. It was about his actions, too, including a relentless pressure campaign targeting Republican officials, including his own vice president, Mike Pence. Pence today reacting to the indictment, which mentions him and his role more than 100 times and quotes Trump telling him, you're too honest. I've been very clear. I had hoped it wouldn't come to this. Pence testified before Smith's grand jury and turned over contemporaneous notes he took after his conversations with Trump. For my part, I want people to know that I had no right to overturn the election uh, and that uh, what the president maintained that day and frankly has said over and over again over the last two and a half years is completely false. The former president's attorney with this line of defense. This is an attack on free speech and political advocacy. And there's nothing that's more protected under the First Amendment. And tonight we're learning more about Judge Tanya Chutkin, who will preside over the case. An Obama appointee, Judge Chutkin, has handed down tough sentences to January 6th defendants. She's also rejected Trump's efforts to block the January 6th committee from obtaining his presidential records, declaring presidents are not kings. Our thanks to Pierre Thomas. And with security in the nation's capital already on alert ahead of former President Trump's appearance tomorrow, there was a scare to tell you about today at the Senate with a caller reporting an active shooter. Senate offices on Capitol Hill were obviously put on lockdown immediately as officers searched floor to floor. But in the end, it appears to have been a false call. ABC's Aaron Katursky was on scene in Washington for us. Tonight, on the eve of Donald Trump's arraignment in Washington, D.C., with security on high alert... Which way? ...evidence of how seriously authorities are taking any threat. Which way? Which way? Oh, oh, oh. A scare in the Senate triggering this massive police response. Hundreds of officers rushing to Capitol Hill. We could hear banging and screaming. We could hear shouting uh, in the halls. Authorities say it started with a concerning call, an active shooter inside a Senate office building around 2.30 in the afternoon. The caller did not report hearing gunshots, but gave police a description of someone wearing body armor. See where the bench is. That's where you need to be. Go back. The Senate side of the Capitol put on lockdown. We see about 20 Capitol Hill police running down the hall with uh, vests on, guns drawn. Officers searching the three Senate office buildings floor by floor before giving the all clear. We found no confirmation that there was an active shooter um, and that this may have been a, a, a bogus call. But tonight, authorities say they are prepared for anything with history set to play out in this city tomorrow. Aaron Katursky in our nation's capital. Aaron, thank you. And now to the sentencing verdict in the Shabbat massacre at a Pittsburgh synagogue nearly five years ago now. The jury voted unanimously that Robert Bowers deserved the death penalty for what is the deadliest anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history. Tonight, the families and survivors are weighing in. Ariel Resha reports. Tonight, the gunman who stormed that Pittsburgh synagogue, killing 11 in the deadliest attack on the Jewish community in U.S. history, sentenced to death by a federal jury. He murdered them because they were Jewish. After 10 hours of deliberations, the same 12 jurors who weeks earlier found Robert Bowers guilty on all 63 criminal counts, voting unanimously that he should be put to death. Hate has no place in our community. A judge will now decide whether to uphold that jury recommendation. Prosecutors have said Bowers was hunting for Jews when he entered the Tree of Life Synagogue in October 2018, gunning down congregants during Sabbath prayers, the victims ages 54 to 97. Just before his deadly rampage, prosecutors say Bowers posted anti-Semitic and xenophobic rants on social media. At trial, Rabbi Jeffrey Myers, seen here in this police body camera video fleeing the massacre, flanked by the SWAT team, testifying about his desperate call to 911. Today we received an immense embrace from the halls of justice around all of us. Tonight, families of the victims and survivors reacting to the jury's decision. The daughter of Daniel Stein saying justice has been served. I feel like a weight has been lifted and I can breathe a sigh of relief. May my father's light shine eternally and his memory along with the 10 other victims forever be a blessing. Ariel Reshef reporting tonight. Ariel, thank you. 
Now to the migrant crisis, which is stretching from the border to major cities, including right here in New York City. And Mayor Eric Adams is making a new plea for federal help to handle the influx of migrants now on the city streets. ABC's Stephanie Ramos spoke with some of them today and has this report. Tonight, New York City officials sounding the alarm after these concerning images. Hundreds of migrants on the sidewalk in Midtown Manhattan. We need help. We need, we need help. And it's, it's not going to get any better. Uh, it, from, from this moment on, on it's downhill. Dozens sleeping on cardboard outside the Roosevelt Hotel, waiting for a spot inside the intake center. Police officers offering food. It's not a healthy position for folks to be in, especially after having such long journeys. New York nearing a breaking point while crossings are down at the southern border. Busloads of migrants are still arriving in the city every week. More than 95,000 asylum seekers have arrived since last spring. Nearly two thirds of them are now in the city's care. City shelters at capacity. Ranier hey. Adrián came from Venezuela. He's been waiting for a room at the Roosevelt for two days. No me quejo y esperaré el tiempo que sea necesario que yo... So many here have come from so far away, but like Raniel, they say they prefer this wait to the dangers back home. Stephanie joins me now. Stephanie, what are New York City officials saying about how long this particular migrant influx could last? Well, they say there's really no telling. City officials just today said that 2,300 asylum seekers arrived in New York City last week alone. They say there doesn't seem to be an end in sight, and they are urgently asking for the federal government's help. Phil. All right. Stephanie Ramos from New York City. Stephanie, thank you. A Georgia mother of three is under arrest in the Bahamas, accused of plotting to kill her estranged husband. The couple in the middle of a bitter divorce and a custody battle, despite her social media posts that paint a very rosy picture. Here's ABC's Eva Pilgrim. Tonight, a Georgia mother of three behind bars, accused of plotting to kill her estranged husband while he was on a trip to the Bahamas. Last but not least, I want to thank me. For years, Lindsay Shiver posted glimpses of the family's picture-perfect life on social media, many during vacations in the Bahamas. But prosecutors now say the 36-year-old mother hatched a plan with her lover and a hitman to murder her husband of 13 years, Robert Shiver. Bahamian police say they stumble upon the alleged plot while investigating her new boyfriend, Terrence Bethel, for an unrelated burglary, finding incriminating messages on his phone. The Shivers were college sweethearts who met at Auburn University, where Robert played football for the Tigers. But court documents show the couple was in the midst of a divorce. Earlier this year, Robert filing citing adulterous conduct. Lindsay replying, accusing him of physical and mental cruelty and acts of domestic violence, saying she feels unsafe in the marital home. Eva Pilgrim tonight. Eva, thank you. New York City police have identified a suspect in the deadly stabbing of 28-year-old dancer O'Shea Sibley. Sibley was dancing at a gas station with his friends as they filled up their car when a bystander who was at the scene said they were confronted by a group who yelled homophobic slurs before Sibley was stabbed. New surveillance video viewed by police shows a heated exchange between the two groups. This week, New York City Mayor Eric Adams said we will find the person responsible. The killing has put a renewed spotlight on the violence against the LGBTQ plus community. And tonight, we are also tracking a wild case in Oregon involving a possible serial kidnapper. A woman says she escaped her captor in Oregon who kidnapped her and held her in a jail cell in his garage. That case has the FBI opening now a nationwide investigation. And could there be more victims is the question they are asking. Chief National Correspondent Matt Gutman reports. Tonight, the FBI says a young woman fought tooth and nail to free herself from this cinder block cell to escape from a man they allege is a serial rapist. The woman fought for her life, beating the doors and the walls of this cell with bloodied hands. The FBI naming 29-year-old Nagasi Zuberi as the suspect, saying he had many other aliases, but whose career as an alleged predator living in plain sight began to unravel in Seattle on July 15th when he is accused of posing as a police officer. He kidnapped a prostitute. According to the complaint, Zuberi drove her 450 miles to his home in Klamath Falls, Oregon. They say he then locked her in this makeshift cell. Cinder blocks, a naked light bulb, that hardback chair, and some water. 
he had actually locked her in there for a couple hours at least until she realized that she needed to get out of that residence because her life was in danger. So they said she decided to fight. When she was trying to escape the cell itself, she had repeatedly punched it with her own hands and she had several lacerations along her knuckles. Through her perseverance, she broke free and waved down a passing motorist asking for their help to call 911. The next day, officials capturing Zuberi in this Walmart parking lot in Reno, Nevada. The complaint saying there was a standoff, Zuberi in the car with his children. It's actually quite common for serial offenders to become more violent as they move along. The fantasy and obsession become much greater. To fulfill it, they have to become more violent. Authorities already recovering these disturbing handwritten notes. In one, he jotted, dig a hole straight down 100 feet. Another, entitled Operation Takeover, describes what appear to be best practices for a kidnapping, including make sure they don't have a bunch of people in their life. You don't want any type of investigation. Matt Gutman tonight. Matt, thank you. A new report from the March of Dimes has found that millions of women here in the United States have little to no access to maternity care, and a third of all counties in the country are maternal care deserts. Various factors weigh in, of course, uh, to why that is, including health facilities looking to save money, but it's women and babies paying the price. Our Janae Norman with the story. America is facing a maternal health crisis. As of a new report out today, more than 5.6 million women in the U.S. currently live in counties with limited or no access to maternity care services, and it can be a matter of life or death. We know that women who don't have prenatal care are three to four times more likely to die compared to women who have prenatal care. That. When a county has no birthing facilities or practicing OBGYNs, they're designated by the March of Dimes as a maternity care desert. Do you feel like the situation around maternal care deserts has gotten better or is it worse off than it was 10 years ago? No, it's getting worse. Um, the number of uh, patients affected by maternity care deserts is increasing. It's a combination of financial constraints for hospitals, lack of providers who are willing to live in areas that are more rural. In Colorado, more than 37% of counties are maternity care deserts, including Moffitt County, the next closest facility for patients an hour away at UC Health in Steamboat Springs. Faith Weather raced an hour to Steamboat when she realized her baby wasn't moving. I go in for testing and seeing if everything looks okay and my water breaks. While the baby was okay, three days after giving birth, she had another complication while recovering and needed to get back to the center. Because I couldn't drive myself. I was calling my dad and I was like, hey, we need to get to Steamboat as soon as possible. When Brittany Thompson was ready to give birth to her second child, she knew she had an hour and a half drive to the hospital and steamboat, but things didn't go according to plan. And I had a baby land side at 940 on the side of the highway. She was 30 minutes from the hospital when she says her contractions started getting more intense. She told her husband to call 911. The ambulance got there right as she was crowning. And so then I just delivered her. Our thanks to Janae Norman, and there is still much more to get to tonight. Coming up, who's been responsible for the way people give birth and receive reproductive care? Author Allison Yarrow's book dives into the implications she says it's had on society. But next, a deadly end to an investigation targeting criminal groups, what police seized in a major raid. Here in Poland. Here in Kentucky. No match for the tornado. From Monterey Park, California. On the ground in Ukraine. Reporting from Uvalde, Texas. ABC News Live is right there everywhere. From the scene of that deadly missile strike in Dnipro, Ukraine. Reporting from the earthquake in Turkey. From Charleston, South Carolina on the 2024 campaign trail. From Kathmandu, Nepal. In Truckee, California covering record snowfall. Traveling with the president in Mexico City. Wherever the story. Here at this airport in Tampa, it's already shut down. Reporting with the nurses on the picket line. Reporting from Jerusalem. Here at 10 Downing Street in London. Streaming live to you. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. Wherever the story is. We're going to take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. You're streaming ABC News Live. ABC News Live. Streaming free everywhere. America's number one streaming news.
All right, here we go. You ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is What Would You Do? Let's go. How are you? Hi, <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Reporting from Denver, I'm Mola Lenghi. Wherever the story is, we'll take you there. You're streaming ABC News Live. Welcome back. We are tracking several headlines around the world right now. Rain and flooding brought on by a typhoon has led to intense rescue efforts in Beijing and surrounding cities. Footage by Chinese state media shows elderly people and babies being evacuated. The storms are the worst to hit northern China in more than a decade. At least nine people were killed by police in a raid in Rio de Janeiro targeting members of criminal groups. Police managed to seize seven rifles, ammunition and grenades. During the raid, officers were attacked, they say, by armed individuals. One officer was wounded, but we're told is in stable condition. TikTok has been banned in Senegal as part of a clampdown on dissent just days after the country's main opposition party was dissolved and its leader taken into custody. This is just the latest move after restricting access to internet services just this past Monday, citing threats to the instability of the nation. Who, what, and when determine the right way people should give birth and receive reproductive care? In her new book, Birth Control, The Insidious Power of Men Over Motherhood, Alison Yarrow writes about how men overwhelmingly shaped birth in America. Alison joins us now to talk about this book, which I've just started to get into. Thank you so much for taking the time to be here. I think right off the bat, um, you tell everybody what you're gonna do in this book. You say, birth is dangerous, medicine is safe. That's the narrative, but it's far from reality. And that's what we're all told. The reality is that birth in America and how we become parents is broken. And that's because of a number of factors, but one of the big ones is that we are led to believe that birth is scary, that it's dangerous routinely. Well, every and time so we see it in a movie, right? Every time we see it in a movie, you see, you know, cut to the gurney flying down right. the hall, right? The woman is screaming, she's crazy. Right. The doctor's the only sane one in the room. Right. This narrative, this is the narrative that I grew up with. This is what birth is like. Birth, we know from the research, the safest thing for you is to, to look at birth as a physiologic experience. It is a process in the body, but we have made it into a procedure in a hospital. You're an award-winning journalist. This is not your first book, and you did extensive research for this book, but you also had life experience. You, you gave birth three times, two at the hospital, one at home. So you have real experience with both. Um, in your experience, which do you think was safer and better? I preferred my home birth, and that was because I was given space, I was given time, I was under the care of a midwife and a doula. We had a, a really strong, trusting relationship. My two first births in the hospital were great births, but there were ways in which I was plugged into a managed care system where I had to sort of fend off care that I didn't want. I felt coerced into care that I didn't need. Pelvic exams, um, you know, they, they asked if, can, can we break your water when I was taking too long? And I didn't want that to happen. I wanted to go into labor naturally but I felt pressured. In your chapter, uh, Childbearing Hips, right, um, how birth became increasingly medicalized and even, in your words, racist, being based on beliefs from the past that pelvises and babies' heads come out in different shapes and sizes. So how did that shape the modern birthing industry? Well, we are in a maternal mortality crisis. It's the highest it's been in my lifetime. And black women are three to four times more likely to die. They also, their pain is not believed when they claim that they have pain. And what I try to show in this chapter in Childbearing Hips is that this is rooted in um, anthropology. This idea that black birthing hips are hardy and pain tolerant, that white birthing hips are frail and fragile and require medicine. And these ideas, though they're old, they're in old medical textbooks, old journal articles, they still, they, they show up today in the care. You say it, the book is not only for men, but doctors as well. What do you want men and doctors to take away from this book? 
I want pregnant people and people who want to be pregnant to read this book to protect themselves. I want people who've given birth but had experiences that were less than rosy, not what they expected, to feel validated by this. And for doctors and men and, and midwives, everyone who cares for people who are pregnant and giving birth, I want them to see that, yes, their experiences matter too. I want them to see to be validated in reading these pages. And what we need is we need a medical system that can support the birthing body, giving birth, can support after the birth, during the postpartum period. And I think what would really help is often when women are giving birth, not all birthers are women. Some people who give birth do not identify as women and mothers. They identify as birthing people, but most people identify as women and mothers, and many of their partners are men. So their men are already there. They're in the room. They're at the doctor's visits. You're invested. <laughs> You're there. So you can do so much to ensure that your partner is being listened to, being heard. Alison Yarrow, thank you so much for the book. Thanks for coming in and talking to us. I really appreciate it. You can purchase Birth Control, The Insidious Power of Men Over Motherhood, wherever books are sold. And still to come, need a boost of energy? The viral McDonald's dessert hack that will definitely give you at least a sugar rush. When I got sent to Idaho to cover the murders of four college students, it was a story that didn't make any sense. Four students stabbed to death in their beds while two roommates were home. You gotta think to yourself, okay, who's the target and how many people would a man go through to get to his target? I'm Kana Whitworth with ABC News. This is the story of savage murders, a determined small town police force and a scholar of crime. This is the King Road Killings. The full series is out now. Listen to every episode wherever you get your podcasts. With so much at stake, so much on the line, more Americans turn here than any other newscast. ABC News, World News Tonight with David Muir, America's number one most watched newscast across all of television. From America's number one news comes the all new ABC News app. Breaking news, incredible video, faster, smarter, and customizable to your interests. If you love being in the know, you're gonna love this. Experience the all new ABC News app. Download it now. All right, here we go, you ready? Let's do it. Yes, it's the show America wants and America needs right now. This is what would you do? Let's go. How are you? Thank <laughs> you. Yes. So what will you be watching Saturdays on ABC News Live? What would you do? Hey, I guess I just found out. <laughs> the What Would You Do Marathon, 2 to 6 Eastern, every Saturday on ABC News Live. My favorite show. Finally tonight, the sweet Sunday hack that is getting millions of hits on social media. Two moms got creative and came up with their own DIY dessert using McDonald's favorites. Will Reeve has it. Oh gosh, it does get a little messy in the car, but it's worth it. It's the latest dessert trend that has the internet feeling the sugar rush. McDonald's mashup inspired Sunday, scooping up nearly 10 million views on TikTok. Oh wow. Best friends Joy and Lisa showing off their ice cream creativity at the drive-thru, alongside Lisa's influencer daughter Janelle, taking this summer treat to the next level. It's a party. Babe, it's a party. It's a party. I had to try it for myself. Six vanilla ice cream cones, please. And the small fries. Now that we've got all the ingredients, it's time to create our monster sundae. First, we'll smash six ice cream cones together, throw in some cookies, layer it with some fudge, and last but certainly not least, sprinkles. Then I checked in with the creators behind the trend to show them my masterpiece. Okay, so I've made my ice cream smash cake right here. Oh, look at that. Oh, that's oh, pretty. So I'm gonna do. I'm gonna dip the fries first. Oh, he's going for it, man. I'm oh, going for it. That's very good. What did it feel like when you found out that your thing that you do for fun at McDonald's or wherever is like super popular now? Crazy fun. Yeah, it feels, it feels fun. I think it's fun memories. It's fun to do, it's a fun activity, and it makes everybody laugh. I just couldn't get enough. No, it looks amazing. For me, the fries, I'm told I need to try fries and ice cream. I haven't yet, but I will. That's our show for tonight. I'm Phil Lipoff. ABC News Live is here for you all night with the latest news, context, and analysis, and some dessert. You can always find us on Hulu, Roku, the ABC News app, and of course, abcnews.com. Good night.
This is ABC News Live. The crush of 